Alrighty folks, welcome back to part 2 of chapter 11 for GEO 100 and chapter 17 for GEO 111. Talking about groundwater. Uh, and groundwater is very important. Again, last time we discussed how uh, groundwater makes up the majority of our, our liquid fresh water supply. And of course, uh, as humans, we use almost exclusively fresh water. So groundwater is very important to us. A few definitions to make around groundwater. First of all, hydraulic conductivity. This is a measure of how easily wa uh, water flows through a layer of earth or rock. It's essentially a measure of, of permeability and porosity. Um, an aquifer, and I know we've uh, all heard that term, this is, uh, in this uh, case, a water-bearing layer with a high hydraulic conductivity. So in other words, it has high porosity, high permeability. Sandstones often make very good, good aquifers. Right? The opposite is an aquitard or aquaclude, and I don't mean somebody who can't figure out how to swim. What I mean is a layer with a low hydraulic conductivity, so low permeability, low porosity. Water doesn't like to flow through it very well, so this would be something like a shale. So this is a, an aquitard, uh, it's an upper one, a lower one, right? Then, then we have a couple different types of aquifers as well. We have first we have unconfined aquifers. And this is any aquifer that is open to the atmosphere and, and, and surface conditions. So this area over here, this, this yellow area right here, uh, this would be an unconfined aquifer, right? Or I'm sorry, this this blue area down here. This would be an unconfined uh, aquifer. So any any water uh, that uh, falls or precipitates onto this surface area overlying this aquifer uh, has the chance to, you know, make it down uh, into uh, the unconfined aquifer. Down below that, we have a confined aquifer, and this is an aquifer that is separated from surface conditions by an aquitard or aquaclude, whatever you want to call it, right? So this impermeable layer water will not pass through it it keeps these two bodies of water separate so the unconfined aquifer and the confined aquifer stay separate from each other right in this confined aquifer because it is confined uh, the water is, is uh, under pressure uh, and this is what causes uh, what we know as artesian flow just pressurized flow that's all artesian means right so while any drop of water landing on this whole area can become part of the, you know, unconfined aquifer. There's only a very limited area where the 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 confined aquifer can recharge groundwater, and that would be wherever that that aquifer unit pokes up at the surface. So as you see here, this unit kind of bends and then appears at the surface. So it is a very very limited recharge area, but uh, the um, not only water, but anything you happen to spill on here has the potential to make it down into the unconfined aquifer, whereas a confined aquifer is generally much more sealed off. And this is the case that we see in, let's say, I don't know, Rockford, Michigan, right, where we have Wolverine Worldwide uh, dumping uh, back in the 60s and 70s PFOS into uh, dump sites. And now through the years that has flown down into this unconfined aquifer that is flowing through the unconfined aquifer. So if you drill your home well, right, most home wells just go down to an unconfined aquifer. If you are downstream or downslope from the uh, from the, the site of contamination, you have a potential of, uh, you know, your, your well being contaminated as well. And this was what happened to a lot of folks in Rockford, Michigan. Now, I also live in Rockford, but do not worry, folks, I am safe. I am on city water and city water gets their water from this, what the confined aquifer. So this is sealed off from that unconfined aquifer and there's been no PFAS contamination determined in the confined aquifer. So the nice thing about a confined aquifer is it, it uh, is it's harder to pollute, uh, but it doesn't recharge nearly as fast, right? And uh, also importantly, again, I mentioned this before, but water table is not flat. Uh, it changes with seasons, but it also mimics surface topography. So high area, areas like, like hills will have, uh, the water table will be a little bit higher. Low areas, it'll be a little bit lower. Right, and water does uh, underground as well as on the surface flow via gravity, so it flows to these lower areas. Right? 
when we're talking about these confined aquifers, these artesian aquifers, right? Again, they're under pressure, and this pressurization leads to what we call a potentiometric surface. Again, these only can occur in a confined aquifer. Uh, and what it is is, is, is uh, the potentiometric surface is the height to which that, that water wants to, uh, to, to go. So it's basically a measure of potential energy. So here, if we look here, here's our unconfined aquifer. If you were to drill your well down into the unconfined aquifer, your well height, the water in the well, would be exactly where the, the water table is, right? No pressurized, it's unpressurized, it would be right there, right? However, if you keep going and you drill down into that unconfined or that confined aquifer which is pressurized right now because it's pressurized it's actually going to push that water farther up the straw if you will right to that potentiometric surface right so this would be what we consider a non-flowing artesian well if that potentiometric surface is above the land surface then the water will flow out such as like a spring this is called a flowing artesian well right? so Anywhere where the water is coming out of the ground, whether we suck it out or it's, you know, a stream or lake, right? That is groundwater discharge, but groundwater recharge is, is then any water that is infiltrating into the aquifer and actually recharging it, right? And of course, groundwater discharge, movement of groundwater back to the surface via wells, lakes, streams, what have you. So the important thing about groundwater recharge is that groundwater will only recharge if the soil moisture is high enough to cause gravity to pull it down. So in other words, you know, when we were talking like drops of water, water has both cohesive and adhesive forces, right? So it wants to, it's got surface tension, it wants to stick to, to things. So basically, unless your ground is saturated, you know, it's been raining and the ground is saturated, then finally there's enough uh, uh, water in there that it's gonna, you know, via gravity flow down into the groundwater. But unless that happens, uh, we're not uh, recharging the groundwater. So this means, you know, in the summer months and our drier months, there's not much recharge. Most of the recharge happens, you know, uh, in the spring when we have lots of snow melt and, and rain, right? However, it is important to note that even though recharge is, is very sporadic, groundwater discharge is fairly constant and does happen year round. So naturally, there's a dynamic equilibrium, right? Overall, the rate of recharge and discharge are, are equaled out. How do we know that? Well, because our entire planet isn't, you know, our entire ground isn't full of water and we actually still have groundwater. So there must be some sort of balance. But of course, now we are experiencing groundwater withdrawal, which is also known as groundwater mining. And this is where, you know, we would draw it at a much higher rate then it can replenish itself, right? So an interesting thing happens if you if you drop a well into groundwater, right? So you basically you drop your straw into the ground there uh, and you start to suck. Well, what happens is, you know, as, as you, you pull that water up, you create a conical in three dimensions, conical shaped depression of the groundwater surrounding your well. Uh, and this is because it takes a minute for groundwater to fill back in it doesn't flow you know instantaneously like you know like surface water it takes it a second to, to to flow back in and to to average out so the higher we your withdraw the larger and larger this cone of depression can uh, can become right uh, the use of groundwater has also been very important to allow our populations to expand especially into uh, arid regions such as out west you know Phoenix and Tucson and all these large cities out there, they wouldn't exist unless, uh, you know, uh, well, without the groundwater, right? And this leads us to the idea of, of groundwater mining, uh, which is, of course, when water levels in aquifer get continually lower because we're withdrawing it at a much faster rate than uh, it's being replaced. So we're not able to replace all or, or any of the water that is being withdrawn. Right. And this is especially an issue uh, for the future in arid regions. So here's a nice, beautiful picture of, of uh, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, with the uh, you know, saguaro cactus, very iconic, right? And interestingly enough, you see all this light green back here. This is the, the elevation range that the saguaro cactus lives in, this very specific elevation range. 
Uh, not that that has to do with this lecture, but anyway. Uh, our ability to maintain our current rate of, of food production and, and, and everything, especially in these areas, relies on heavily on our use of aquifers, right? Uh, so arid regions are especially vulnerable uh, to this, uh, to groundwater withdrawal because in groundwater mining, because again, there's very little precipitation. It's an arid region, there's very little surface and very little groundwater. What groundwater is there is deep, right? And it's also important to know the last time these regions were wet enough that the groundwater actually recharged was 12,000 years ago when the ice was far enough south that there was plenty of water flowing in this area and that was recharging the groundwater. But for the last 12,000 years, not a drop of water has gone into these aquifers out west, yet we continually to use them up at higher and higher rates of speed. Right? Just to show you kind of here, state by state, you know, groundwater withdraws. Over here, we've got lots of water, so we don't need to draw as much groundwater. Out west, they would draw a lot more. Uh, what are some issues with groundwater withdrawal? Well, increasing well costs. As groundwater gets lower and lower, you need to keep digging your wells deeper and deeper and deeper. Right? Uh, as groundwater gets lower, uh, especially in, in air, human regions here, if we start to lose groundwater, uh, it means our, our stream and spring flow is going to be reduced. We also get salt water intrusion. So if you live along the coastline here, like say in Florida, right, and you withdraw groundwater and you happen to be right next to an ocean, something's going to come and fill it in. Guess what's going to fill it in? It's going to be that salt water. So now, say you live, you know, right next, like a mile from the uh, ocean and the salt water intrusion down in Florida now is like three miles inland. So maybe, you know, a year or two ago you had fine water, but now the saltwater intrusion line has crossed past your well, and now you're just withdrawing salt water. It's ruined your well. You have no, no other options. You can't go deeper. It's not going to be fresh water. Once you get salt water into an aquifer, once you get anything into an aquifer, it's almost impossible to get it out. Right? And then as you would draw tons and tons of, of water uh, from the subsurface, right now you don't have that, that pressure, that, that push of the water back uh, towards the surface, so land tends to sub subside as well, and this uh, tends to cause depression in areas, so the withdrawal of lots of, of, of water from, like, say, Houston, underneath Houston water, oil, natural gas, has caused the city center of Houston to sink, and basically Houston's a giant, giant bowl now, which is why flooding is such an issue for them. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed chapter 11 slash 17. We will see you next time.